do have uh, um, I see we do have uh, participants in. Thank you, Jacques, for starting the recording. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to have you in the room with us. Um, topic four, a design for online and blended learning, the fourth topic on the course. And we are delighted uh, to have our guest, uh, Dr. Robin Kay, with us this afternoon. I'll introduce him in a, in a moment. Um, but just so that you know the agenda for today, um, uh, Robin will has a presentation and obviously we'd like to engage with participants. So if there are any questions, uh, you're free to drop them in the chat. Both Jorg and um, Lars will be monitoring the chat. Um, but I know that Robin likes to engage with the participants. So I'm sure there'll be an opportunity at some point during the course of the afternoon to engage directly with them outside of the chat. Um, but having said that, um, it's a, a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Robin. Um, I first came across Robin, one of Robin's publications back, I think it was in March 2022, uh, Thriving Online, a guide for busy educators, uh, which I, I just read with uh, great um, inspiration um, from some of the practical applications of the work uh, that Robin um, and his colleagues were doing. So it's uh, it's lovely to have you um, with us, I think, for the fourth time now, Robin, as our guest on this topic, been really well received by participants in previous iterations, and we, we're delighted to have you back again. Um, Robin is uh, Dean and full professor uh, of the Faculty of Education at Ontario Tech um, in uh, Oshawa in Canada. So he's, uh, I think, about seven hours or so behind, six, six hours behind Sweden at this time. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, he's been in higher education for, for over 25 years. I think he's been, I think you've been at your current uh, institution for the last, since 2003, the last 20 um, odd years, uh, but 14 of those years have really been focused in, in online teaching and um, many papers have been published, many conferences attended and uh, Robin's current research uh, in AI and education has obviously taken on a new impetus, but online and e-learning education technology uh, continue to be key interests for him and his research. Um, the one thing I've always enjoyed about Robin is his um, uh, the manner in which he, he shares willingly practical applications of a lot of the research and the theories that he's come across, and I expect the same uh, will apply today. So without further ado, uh, Robin, welcome, and over to you. Thanks, Anne. Uh, I will just jump into this and... What I want to say is it's a yeah, it's a relatively small group, so feel free to interrupt. I uh, will either rely on Lars or Jorg not to be uh, on their emails or uh, shopping. No, I'm kidding. Um, to to maybe look at the chat and and if their questions come in, but uh, I'm okay if you interrupt me. It actually can work better. Um, and I'll try to pause to do that because uh, the audience will pay attention. You you have about, I don't know if it, we're, we're an older group, but I see some younger folks in there, attention spans. Uh, you have about five to 10 minutes. I'm going to go way beyond that. So I'm going to try to keep bringing you in. So we'll see how that goes. All right. So I'm going to share my screen and pop into slideshow. And so... As Anne has suggested, this is talking about thriving online in higher education. I'm going to address a number of areas that uh, I've experienced over the last 14, 15 years in teaching online. And um, yeah, you've probably, I'm sure you have access to the book. It's free, so it's no big sell. I'm finding, though, at this stage, even within a year or so, um, the urge to actually rewrite a fair bit of it in some ways because of the introduction of chat GPT and um, it being well one of the most prominent game changers in my life so uh, so let's go for a bit of a test drive I'm going to pop in the chat here and so um, 
I'm hoping that you, uh, you're using Zoom. So I'm wondering what city or town, country, and time you're signing in from today. Uh, just if you give me some perspective that, uh, so I can know my audience a little bit better. Cape Town, South Africa, Sweden, Karlstad, Sweden, Singapore, Sweden, Finland, nice. So Singapore is even a different time, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm at eight in the morning, which is fine. Um, I get up around then. If, many years ago, that would have been year early, but that's not now, so. Uh, so now cameras on, I'm sure, uh, thank you. Most of you have popped your cameras on, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and it's a little tricky. So, uh, uh, you may have experienced, I'm sure you have, even I, I have, it's hard to get people to turn their cameras on for lots of reasons. Um, I have some fun with the students saying that if you put the camera on, um, you'll be my favorite student. I, I will tell them that it'll certainly be more engaging because I can see people nodding or paying attention or uh, at least pretending to with those eyes when they're looking at their emails. But at least their face is there and I can sort of... Um, but one of the main reasons I talk with students is, is if your camera goes on, I'm going to get to know you better. And that's going to be a huge advantage for you because you don't realize it down the road you may want references. I'm going to get to know you. Uh, otherwise, you're just a name there. And and that becomes nobody wants to be uh, just a name. But just to warm up here, I'm wondering if you could put reasons why st students don't put their cameras on or why you wouldn't. There's lots of good ones. Um, and you can be brutally honest, too. It's like, well, I have to do this while I'm uh, doing <laughs> Messy room, yes. Of course, we can always put uh, the blur in the back. And they do chores, so doing chores while you're actually, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's certainly. Right, yeah, if I'm on the screen and sharing, of course, they feel that they're family in the background, bad hair day tired of looking at ourselves. I've been tons of meetings. It's like, really? Do I look this bad? Is that so there's lots of reasons and I think we have to be sympathetic to those. And if they understand them, that that makes sense. Um, but uh it definitely is better interaction when you're when you're doing that. And then last, I'm just gonna ask about the chat. Uh what's the best thing about teaching online from your perspective? Or what are the some of the better things? No commute, absolutely. Flexibility, travel, flexible. Almost all show up, yeah. They just have to turn on their screen, even if they don't put their cameras on. Flexibility. I'm not sure about the students you teach. Um, there's having people in Singapore. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, and a wider audience. I'm not sure who you teach, but um, we're finding there's a new sort of breed of student out there um, who are like us caught in betwixt in between online and face-to-face. -face. Uh, we, we understand that there's a joy of face-to-face -face and getting to know people, but we're actually putting a little bit, we, we, question it a little bit. I do I really want to travel an hour to to uh, have lunch with Lars? Probably because I haven't met Lars and that would be very nice. But it might be like, I could get two hours of work done there. I could do a workout. I could go for a walk. There's things that, and students think the same way. And so we're now into, we, we offer a lot on programs, online programs. We actually offer both options to students. Um, in different ways, and uh, we're leading into Canada that way, and we're finding that people actually alternate even within the same class. So um, interesting. All right, so I'm gonna. Oh, by the way, just uh, you may have noticed. Probably didn't. 
because I wouldn't ask TTP as TTP. I'm going to explain what that's about. There's a big mystery there, but I'll tell you about that in about a second or so. So this is TT, and it's the kind of introduction you can do the prof as a professor. It's fairly typical. Uh, Anne's told you all about the kinds of things I've done. Uh, it's officious, and uh, but it kind of establishes your credibility and the kinds of things you've done. Uh, the other kind of introduction you can do, and you can do both, is, and, and people get, you know, it's pictures right away. It's like, oh, what's this person about? Well, oh, I love hiking. I love biking. Uh, I love motorcycle, uh, which is kind of fun. I've just been learning how to downhill ski and uh, you know, line skating. So there's, there's some different things that people can identify with. That's probably a little bit more uh, engaging online and it can establish, uh, to can do uh, different things there, but I'll tell you what DT is in a second here. So I said, well, for this, this uh, well, the caveat's actually for today's workshop. My goal is to offer the best suggestions that I know based on cognitive science, uh, learning science, on online research, and 14 years experience teaching on in higher education. Uh, but each context is different. Um, it's class sizes, subject matter, there's labs, there's assessment, there's all kinds of different learning goals and things could be different for you in my environment. Um, so your questions and challenges and, you know, yeah, buts and that kind of thing are, are more are welcome because uh, no one person can know it all, of course. And I do have a strong bias towards this type of learning, synchronous and virtual online format. I think it's quite an advantage. Um, and historically, if you look at some of the, the records, and I've done this uh, right now, we have about a 95% success rate completion rate in uh, our degrees in online learning, which is unheard of generally. Uh, there's lots of reasons, but we do a lot of synchronous. Uh, and if you look at the best in North America, best programs graduate, it's about 55% success rate. So those are some, that's one piece I think towards it. Um, so one, I'm just curious, before we begin, what's one key question? You can ask more than one, but uh, if you feel like another one comes up, do you have about teaching and learning online? Always good to start with questions. Are not more colleagues doing it? Okay. They are in our university, but <laughs> some people have caught on. So I went with it in a while, but Now, I'm all excited because I know these questions are going to be either very deep or that I've lost you already. And so, uh, what's the best way to interact online with students? Good question. How do we design learning for synchronous and asynchronous? Yes. Best way to interact. How is AI going to change the way we teach? What's that? That's Anne. Okay. Feeding Anne's feeding me into the. Uh... <laughs> all right. I don't want to get all these busy. Questions are a very good place to start. Uh, how can. Uh, VI support sense of group uh, longing between students when they meet mostly online. How can we make sure that students reach the learning objectives? Asynchronous. How do you get students engaged? These are all great questions. And I'm going to give you the, the, the short answer, which I've been thinking about this very deeply for uh, quite a while, is you actually don't need me to, to, to answer these questions. Um, you can start to have a very rich discussion with Chad GPT on these questions. And of course, you're going to challenge the kinds of things it gives you. Um, I've been playing with it for quite a while, and it's uh, coming very close and actually suggesting lots of different things that I can verify from my experience as I'm doing things, but or, you know, the, like how do you engage with our activities, uh, but it can get really quite deep. Um, so it's a game changer. In almost any category that I'm talking today, you could ask Jack, Jack GPT and these questions, you could engage with them. Um, so for example, I was playing around creating a strong e-culture. How, how can I do that with my classes? Uh, it's going to be a read about questions. questions. So suggestions you have to have a strong e-culture and online course or regular foods. And it's not, I just don't think they're most of these suggestions either are very reasonable. If I wanted to, I could have said, and please give me citations and links to those citations, right? Check so this is research support. Um, and then I articulate with that GPT because I pretend it's a person I know doesn't care, but it, it does respond. Um, so I said, all these suggestions, how about a set of rules, guidelines, how students hate in online graduate class? What I was trying to get is NetCat, and uh, it gave me suggestions that were, and it gave me some information with uh, NetCat, I was saying, camera, microphone use. It's addressing all the key areas. Um, and I've been asking, you offer some specific suggestions in the area of NetCat. That's where I was kind of going because I wasn't sure. And uh, there were some pretty good suggestions that seemed to refer to it as online. And then I said, what about in class synchronous NetCat? Because I was, it was giving me asynchronous. And then the top of the camera, I hands, actively staying respectfully. Um, Lots of really good suggestions that I could have worked with. Um, understanding that I've done a lot of this, so I can assess these. It's very difficult sometimes to not, you know, like if you're new to this. However, it certainly is helpful. Um, and then someone asked about online activities, and I'll just briefly look at that. So, um, engaging activities in online synchronous. The specific I get, the better it gets. Um, the audio, the activity, one 15, 45 minutes, and it gave a lot of uh, good suggestions and even more suggestions than I've used because I haven't done these things in my class. So I haven't done very full feedback. Uh, uh, lightning round questions, but it's a pretty good idea, actually. Um, and then he was elaborate on, and I even picked up my horrible typing on mid mapping, which was my mapping, uh, and what I know. And um, it chose a tool to find and forgives me some tools, find some topic, create branches, add layers. Um, and then I went on thinking, please provide suggestions for your organizing non effective breakout rooms because that's, and it gave some pretty good suggestions um, and ones that I'm driven to see. And then what suggestions you have for ensuring individual accountability in breakout rooms, right? Because I kept getting deeper, like, well, yeah, but what? So Zach, my coach, and I had some pretty good suggestions, actually. Um, and uh, you, you can look at these details. I won't read this horribly. Small, but um, 
it was satisfying and unnerving and having these conversations with ChatGPT because I was like, whoa, wait a second, why am I relevant anymore? In terms of, uh, and and uh, I, I don't have much of a need, so it didn't really matter to me because it was, but, but I, I did see the power in it helping in these deeper conversations. So um, I'm just curious, how many people use ChatGPT in a, um, even a beginning or intermediate way? You've had conversations that, uh, when I first used it, I used it like Google, which didn't actually work very well. Yeah, it can be, uh, in terms of references, it can be certainly a problem. And of course, that's, that's the kind of fact where we do come in. It is any better. Um, so yeah, I would never trust it. Uh, I'll always be checking to see what is coming from. What's the, um, so your you use it. So the person using um, I, I uh, once again, into a session with that, I don't, um, I don't know stocks and ChatGPT. Uh, I just find it startlingly useful. Um, and so it's one of those things, um, uh, if, you, if you get into it, uh, you'll find it enormously helpful um, at, the very, at the very minimum of giving suggestions making things. All right, so I'm going to uh, go back to today's menu. It was just uh, an hour from the previous menu, and my changes from each So these are the, the areas um, that I came up with. Actually, yes. so my, uh, my work on the learning framework, I did do HSS. You can see this, and I'll talk about each of those. So I was at SBCDPD. You probably come across this, uh, a very solid model for um, online learning, uh, looking at social presence, uh, so engaging with participants, uh, risk-free expression, when you're in, and encouraging collaboration, working on things. How many presence I'm actually into what's going on. I'm engaged. I want to know what's, I want to know more. I want to ask questions. I want to build, exchange information. Um, and then keeping presence, you know, setting the whole situation up uh, for aging discussions and activities and those kinds of things. And so the interaction of these, we have very supportive discourse, social presence, um, and then we teach you presence in terms of content, and insight, content, and that's what I'm saying, it's a very experience. I'm finding online social presence is one of the critical elements, is why people come. Uh, they don't come just necessarily to, to listen to someone presenting. In fact, I would say they don't come for that reason. Why our synchronous works is they come to meet with each other and then come to talk and they talk there's a community and it's like, oh, there's Anne and I, how are you doing? And then we go back and forth. You can do that. Uh, much, it's impossible for Anne and I to do that because she's in uh, South Africa, but we can we can do this and it's interesting too because we, we get a different perspective on the world. This is a pretty solid model to take a look at things. Uh, we're exploring something new with these sort of uh, structural supports that students experience within courses and things like which is a bit of more pro programmatic in terms of that presence, but these are the three uh, key things. I'm very much, I'm sure you actually listen to David reference, um, uh, that is a very strong um, and well-supported model of research. So here's some big picture ideas that if you didn't get anything from this and you're already starting to fade because I've gone for 10 minutes and I understand that it's hard to stick with things going in and out, um, you could focus or you probably should focus on your organization, uh, what I call a five to 10 minute rule, which I'm, I'm breaking regularly here because if I go for more than five to 10 minutes, I'm, I'm, I risk losing you and that might even be a shorter period of time. Uh, the e-culture, and monitoring that. So I just briefly talk about this. So you have to be online quite a bit more organized, I think, than in the classroom. You have to be. I'm an organized person, so uh, I know others might do things differently. But it's really hard to repair interruptions or flow problems online. It's much harder to bring people back. And so, um, so for example, I have a uh, sample course website. And then within that, I mean, you will use Canva or whatever your, your uh, system is. Even within the lessons, I'll, I'll do something where um, I'm going to tell them their agenda and the goals right away. Everybody, this is something that people like. Uh, and the faculty activities are ahead of time. So the time period. Um, and what we're going to do is sometimes it's links to any section one and section two that are going to work and create uh, slides together. And then asynchronous activities afterwards. And I'm being instructions. I'm not there all the time. And, and uh, especially I like giving email after email, it's nice to have the video instructions so that they, they can um, work with that. So I think it's pretty organized, but it does save me a lot of time. Uh, and then I start putting ChatGPT questions that you could ask and move on to Saturday. How, how this open? Uh, I mean, most of you probably educators understand that, but one pages and you can still on them. Uh, it's pretty helpful. Five to 10 minute content rules. So basically, you're going to have a certain amount of attention that you should shift uh, and so some sort of activity. So you get a super full of interest in that. You have to use a little bit here. Uh, and so I just, uh, actually, I'm going to take a little bit of time to do it. You can also do it in the problems. You can also do it in the problems. And uh, these are some of the slides. It's a game changer. Everybody can work on a slide and we can come back and look at the slides. And uh, oh, sorry, my mouse is I keep uh, hitting it off and it's hitting the floor. And now it's, it's objective to the fact that I dropped it 15 times. So it's not sensitive. You can create my uh, practice problems. They can create case studies. Uh, you can create case studies. You can create very and without a ChatGPT to create some convincing case studies for your particular area. So there's lots of things that you can get them to do with content that you're um, working on. Now, but, but, Center eCulture is really, really important as you start the class. Uh, so uh, I don't know if we really need the how to uh, use Zoom videos, but it's there if someone isn't uh, used to it. And you may be aware of not being what these products are changing quick, uh, quickly. And so you must notice every little while you have to update Zoom, there's something new and something's changed. And so having a video just makes maximum use for people. They're nice. Everyone seems to be pretty that now. Um, and it's not important to click on the video and talk about the smarter than that. And there's rules, which you may not think. Uh, sometimes I get relaxed, but then I come with a group of uh, students that are coming from high school and now they're doing online uh, chat. They seem to most, their comments and things are interesting. It's not like they're evaluating a restaurant, but they're, they're, that kind of language is a little bit different than being in a classroom. And so I'm familiar with that. Most chat monitors be really helpful. Um, chat monitors are uh, helping get stage on questions that have come through there. Uh, the, the, uh, I'm losing the learning lesson. So the, the, um, the um, fact of the matter is, and we all know it intuitively, even some people think they can do multi tasks. So I can monitor chat and it's, it's not unless I shift my focus and shift attention. And but what's helpful is I ask a student monitor chat. They're all over and they love interrupting the professor. And, and, uh, and so um, that's good because if somebody has a question right now, then I'll, I'll stop and we'll have a conversation. That shifts the attention instead of just meeting on it. So, in terms of video creation, that's essential for online learning. You're not creating videos effectively. Um, so problem. And um, I'm just curious, um, in depth, I'll shift here. What are your favorite, what is your favorite video creation tool? Um, and could say I don't create videos yet, too, that's fine. So I'm just curious. I'm just curious about the tools that people are using. Uh, so Zoom, yeah, you could use Zoom. And record, right? Creating videos, MS Teams. Studio to create in Canvas. Let more advanced user. It's been a long time. Okay. Uh, so there's lots of tools more expensive than I use a tool called Snagit, which is great, but there's free tools. Um, 
uh, out there that are available. I'll, I'll talk about them a little bit later. They help you create great videos. Zoom's a little bit awkward, uh, but I use it as well because I can you know, record the screen. And, uh, I have an edit uh, tool, and now there are tools that can learn all your ums and ahs in three seconds, which is great if you're sending uh, as much as they're engaging students. And, uh, and just so you know, it's about 10% of our dialogue, actually. Well, in North America, that might not be. In other I mean, other cultures don't use um and ah. So I tell international students. For some reason, there's a North American uh, need to fill in a space uh, in the, as you're talking. So, uh, so what are my tips for creating videos? Well, yeah, that's two to six minutes. It can be longer depending on your context, but most of us can endure a TED Talk. They're pretty good, but if it's too long, they're not going to work. And now you're recording lectures and things. Uh, very few people are going to watch what they do. They're watching it at twice the speed, which is fine. Uh, can you have a conversation with one student? Uh, perfection. That's actually the hardest thing. If you're a perfectionist, uh, your videos are not your friend. Because we're not, we're not uh, producing entertainment videos. We're not YouTubers or, you know, that we're, we're presenting information. It's meant to be casual. But cool background music, uh, again, it's a distraction when we teach in class. It'd be very unusual for us to pop on some music in the background um, as we're talking. It's an unusual thing to do. I realize it's something that's done. It's entertainment. The context, meaning, title, visuals, and a lot of text. Clearly, I have a mental map. we're talking here. Clearly, layout was important. Clearly, doing and uh, using automatic closed captioning. Uh, I also think there are other things that are involved. Interactivity with videos is really, really important. So you can use our tools out there students can answer questions as they're doing the videos because often online, you can really work with a flip. So you can help. Uh, I will skip this, um, but there's a polling question. I am uh, actually I do this with chat here. Of these, uh, which is the most important do you think in terms of uh, creating videos? You can, you can just, um, you can do multiple types one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or you can put that. Um, for you, what would be the most critical ones? Six visuals. Yes, that's really important. Sound automatic captioning. Good for you, Nicola. A lot of people don't pick that one. Avoid perfection. Avoid perfection. Yeah, if you're just having a conversation, it's going to be quick for you. I use videos to give feedback, and that's just one take because I'm writing a lot of information. So um, some of you might have my background music, but I want the background music. Uh, so now what I'm doing here, too, also is creating a cognitive presence and engagement to when I ask you. Uh, and I, I have a lot of information that I'm uh, realizing there's time constraints here. I would, I would do this very differently if I had lots of time. And I present this information that's going to go in one ear or the other. You can look at it afterwards. But if I actually ask you to pick something, you then have to look at all these and sort of figure out what's going on. And those are the kinds of things you do online, particularly when you're presenting some information. In terms of assessment, there's lots of things you can do. It's pretty important, um, though. Your assessment online is is that in person. They can do lots of checks in the classroom that they can't really do online always. And uh, I'm just thinking about creating assessments, and then I want to create a system of authentic learning. I said, "Help me learn about learning theories, learning teams." And so you can start to get that system. But in general, you want to be crystal clear, uh, startling clear. Uh, checking uh, because otherwise you'll be going through email after email uh, doing this. You do want to have some sort of checks and rubric. Again, it's clarity. That's good practice regardless of what you're on or not. So that's the teaching presence part. I like to do overview of my assignments to walk through. It has saved me hundreds of emails, and I suspect I've added it up. Uh, hours of time answering student emails before assessments because uh, they don't know. And I said, just refer to the video, they know that now. And the video is just, I'm talking to them. So it's like, Magnus, I'm talking to you in person. So this is what you would do. I don't use your name. Um, I suppose there's something where I could merge and, and, and do that. But uh, I talk about, you know, the specific assignment, walk you through, point you to the things that I'd like you to do. And I love to get choice, uh, creativity, and authentic, or what we call non-disposable assignments. So uh, assignments that actually have some meaning for them after the course. In terms of free course, this is actually pretty critical, something we don't do. Um, as often as we should, at least my colleagues, and we teach online here a bit, is a free course a survey, which um, I could also use ChatGPT to help with the questions. Like, what do you want to ask them? What does I want to know? Because the backgrounds, even from where you are right now, I could have asked what you've been helpful in the survey is, are you a teacher? Are you an administrator? Um, a researcher? What, what is it that, you know, you're here, so you're obviously interested in, in this. Um, and then I can gauge also, you know, what are the big questions they'd like to know? I can start to alter the curriculum for that. I like to give um, a big picture video of the course, what's it about? It's actually ahead of time, to be honest, but it's helpful for them to know the online rules before they start, um, how to succeed because sometimes there is a shift to online learning and folks don't know how to do that. Um, student intro videos, especially if it's asynchronous, are quite helpful to know that person a little bit. Uh, it, it gives me, helps me build community. And of course, I'm sure you're aware of the portals of I use it for pages, tennis, and classroom, and so it's there, I suppose, there on that The free course is up to you as a teacher, but each person be more able to have this. I'll talk to students, and colorless, and ensure that they're engaged and they understand what's going on. And then, especially social presence, rules of culture, and um, the shared community. These so technology tools, which are constantly changing, um, there is a miracle tool that just came out for me. It's called um, Magic School. Uh, we have, in, in, um, I'm sure they, they can see the font. We have a program called Magic School Bus in, in North America. It's old, uh, but it's very popular with, with students. Magic School is an AI tool that helps 8 to 12 teachers actually um, develop um, certain kinds of materials very, very quickly and efficiently. Um, obviously, I could ask a colleague to give me a lesson plan, and I'm going to change it and, and do different things. Um, that's my latest tool, which is really, really useful, actually, also for college. Uh, I love this. Uh, it's a free um, uh, tech. Uh, it never gives you too much. I believe there's 400. They're putting the categories. Maybe I'll just do it. Um, that's the technology you know, some version of the So you see it's categorized, but also assessment tools, for example, both publishing tools. Um, and it's helpful for you. I just want to make a list of tools. There's a lot of tools. I have to them all, but sometimes when I have time, which is all there, I'm getting a puzzle is useful because it helps you pop in any video and stop it and have students answer questions and you'll be able to record those questions. So that's actually really useful tool that I came across here. The other one, if you want it free because you want this money, um, is students work together to develop this one online uh, guide for uh, tools and data. And uh, you can see on the website they have lots of tools and they're not for each tool. I'll say upgrade. They use some of the which is free that you overview. Um, not the same model, which is special, but it's really right um, And then uh, some very nice activities to carry out. And so it's actually. Um, so your first class. In the uh, right, yeah, some really good things about you know, oh, handling right. yeah. assessment online uh, in the chat online. All right, we'll uh, Visuals. Uh, what about some of the closed book assessments online? Do you have any doctor in software? Yeah. Um, I'm not the best person to answer that, hand, unfortunately, uh, because we do the response lockdown. Um, there's, uh, but we don't actually in our program do tests or exams um, online. Um, we have a lot. It's authentic assessment. It's, it's, uh, um, but what we've come across in research which support this is exams. I understand it depends on the context, but what they tend to do is um, students study, uh, if you're lucky, for a week before, really, really hard, and drop off their knowledge
any other faculty uses uh, this kind of tools, so they just want to lockdown with cameras watching and monitoring, and it's uh, not particularly popular, I have to say, um, for lots of reasons. Go ahead. Um, I, I asked this question about assessments because I, what worries me is you see in universities, high education institutions, um, traditional assessment uh, of yeah. something nature. Students will come to their video, they'll have yeah. that, that traditional historical yeah. approach to some of the assessments. And the, the formative the assessments, there are two developments, and they yeah. don't form part of the course assessment uh, box. And then we see a lot of exploration by higher education teachers and school teachers. But if you look at the, the shift to a different type of assessment, yeah. Yeah. Evidence, more authenticity in assessment, I believe that that shift has happened in higher education institutions in the in need to. And so you find, um, I often get the question around, well, what about assessment? How do I do that online? Yeah. I want to make sure that students are, are not. Uh, Submitting someone else's work or they plagiarize or they yeah. So the whole question around nature of assessments and authenticity in assessments and how to use and liberty forces the web of these tools to enable students to demonstrate their knowledge or the ability to quickly reflect into it for me needs a whole lot more work when you design um how we're going to assess the learning outcomes of our courses. Wonderfully said. Well, Artie, that's exactly uh, your line with what we do in your correct mode and one in the university. Maybe social sciences says, um, I talked about ChatGPT and all this other stuff. I got to work for you. So we have to educate our students to say, hey, wait a second, <laughs> that's not, you know, and, and people getting will take, but, but many want to learn. And so what this has done is uh, for us has shifted the conversations where professors now have to think a little more deeply about, okay, how is it I want to assess? That's a hard style, right? Um, because they don't come from the they think about it. Um, there is a tool called Critic, um, which we have been investigating, which is a peer evaluation tool. So you have uh, an assignment, you set up the checklist and the rubric, um, it's on a map, and the guys use this, and you get your students to evaluate each other's assignments. Actually, they don't know it's, not, it's anonymous, so they don't lose evaluating who. They get that feedback based on the guideline. The first machine feedback also gives the feedback deeper because it makes sense. So they say, hey, that was harsh. That's the thing. Or this wasn't specific enough. I don't really know. And so they become better at um, giving that feedback. That can be used in a large class. It's almost as accurate as it would that were very closely aligned with the professor would have given in terms of grades in the first place. And it allows for more creative kinds of assignments. Um, and so they're, we have to think deeply about assessment. These tools are not making us think. Especially that you can't okay, we have to make a shift. Otherwise, we're fooling ourselves. Like the old post a discussion post and then comment on two other students or something like that. Unless you got everybody buy in. Mm, they're not there. <laughs> Chat GPT was, and, and, and so, so we make it better doing those. You were doing So uh, your first class, um, what am I going with that? Sorry. Should be the first class. Should be. Yeah. So my first class, I, um, now, could have asked that you people in design, I know, uh, in terms of building community, because there's all sorts of different kinds of ideas, and I tend to, this is a weakness for my teaching, is I tend to want to get right into it, and, and actually, community is huge, I think you've realized in your own, your own uh, course here, uh, that's important for social presence, because people will do the work within the community, they, they, uh, and then uh, engaging teacher introduction, one that I've, I don't know, I, don't know, I think I can do much better than this picture, so I'm sure there's lots of short videos, I'll take those pictures and put it in motion, it's demanding a little bit more now, uh, a graphic big picture and agenda for each class, for example, so they know where we're going. Uh, the online culture icebreakers, I'm, I'm, I'm weak at those, and, and so uh, I could use ChatGPT to give me some, some good tools for adults, for, you know, you can start to gauge it to your audience. Um, and so that would be able to be helpful, and then I give them a lesson plan link ahead of time. This will work So they're just, it's not, the mystery is out of it. I mean, it's mystery with what we're doing in class, but it establishes an organization which is very much appreciated online. It's appreciated in person, too. So in terms of activities, that's the question. What do we do? I definitely would use ChatGPT to help me with this. Uh, for new activities, because we can see a little bit old. One thing, I have the privilege of being the dean of the faculty of education, and so I have colleagues that live to teach and they, they are constantly changing ideas. And so when I meet with them, they'll tell me, you know, I didn't how did I learn about magic school with me. It was one of my colleagues saying, this is a really interesting school that would be incredibly useful for and I started looking at it. Oh my gosh, that is. So how do we get the best practices of everybody? We can't go watch each other in the it's really, really hard. And this is where I do see chat GPT helping a lot because it starts to talk ideas I never came up, came up with or I never thought of. And that could work and I make my own. Um, so I would say chat GPT is three to five, I think it's a little risky, I would say four. Um, because you start as a group get bigger, they people can hide. And and so you want them to, to use that. I have them producing something, whether it's a summary for what they're talking about, if you just throw them in the classroom, um, for them. But if you just put them and say, okay, discuss this question, they will, and then they'll deviate pretty quickly to what they want to talk about, which isn't terrible. It's just not focused. I keep on top of the timing. So I'm actually giving more reminders than I look to chat GPT. They say, give them a five minute reminder, give them, it's like, okay, we got 15 minutes left. Because sometimes, you know, if you're working in a group, you can start to deviate and it's like, whoa, okay, we've got to focus here and circle around. Here are some ideas. Create a discussion, you know, the typical reading and summary. It is one slide summary. How about a visual summary? Um, create a definition of list of characteristics in your subject area. One slide presentation. Uh, prepare to debate on a topic. Um, review an artifact learning tool, a blog post website. Uh, evaluate uh, a video, and generate questions. Um, Oddly enough, I've stumbled across a tool where you can throw the video in and it will generate questions. Uh, so do we have to think anymore? Um, so it, it uh, uh, this is, um, but it, it, as me as an instructor, that could help because I can spend a lot, or I can say, actually, these are good questions. That's a lame question. This, this is helpful. Um, solve the problem in teams. That would be really interesting to play math, physics, those kind of things. We don't get to do that. And so they can start to, as long as you give each team role and then everyone has to understand it, uh, they could work on a case study. So there's all kinds of activities that you can do. I love the two vote polling. Uh, so if I present an idea, uh, it would be perfect right now. I've talked about chat GPT. I'm sure many of you have different attitudes about it. And I could pick some sort of a challenging question with clear, you know, cl uh, two clear different kinds of answers. Um, so poll one, I would say, you know, um, uh, students vote and there'd be a spread of answers, but ideally there'd be a couple uh, areas, you know, ChatGP is excellent. Students should use it for learning. You've got to hide it and block it. You know, there could be that kind of, and then I move into breakout rooms and they, 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 they uh, talk about it and convince each other of their answers to go back and forth. And then we vote again and we see the change, possible changes. This works well for misconceptions, also debating areas, and it focuses students if it is a misconception, then the teachers can talk about, hey, here's the misconceptions. More often than not, 
you shift students and they convince each other and they talk about things that they don't normally talk about, like convincing people of math answers and stuff like that, why this is true. And it helps engage them. And uh, it's a great way to, to, to break up a content presentation. Large class discussions are very difficult. I will uh, consult once I get back in the classroom, which I think will be in another year. Um, a large, uh, you know, how, how do we get these kinds of questions that get people going? How do I get you going as a group? Uh, so priming the topic with an intro or a video poll using the chat, which is useful. Um, having a student monitor the chat, um, asking students specific questions. And if, if they're foolish enough to jump in, and that's all I, I could say, I can answer this in the chat. And I'd be really Magnus in and saying, so Magnus also, and I say, and Magnus puts the answer. Then I say, Magnus, I'm not quite sure I understand. Could you explain it a bit? Then he's going to, you know, hopefully call on Mike and talk about it. And then I'm going to be gentle and thoughtful with him. So others are going to be, okay, this is the kind of teacher that wants to, you know, this is a safe environment they'll start to. So it's a, it's a slow process. Large chat discussions are very hard. And students have the cameras off. They want to look foolish and all these geniuses. And there's all kinds of reasons. So um, it's tricky um, to do that. Consolidation, getting close. You know, the time's not here. Uh, so consolidating work is one of the things we forget uh, to do, or we run out of time. Uh, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm getting close to. So you want to give yourself five to ten minutes at the end of lessons, um, even if you don't finish, to do some sort of uh, consolidation. Maybe have some uh, some maybe key concepts, one slide, a linear summary page, and follow up work they need to do for home activities. Checking with them. Um, so uh, after I uh, saving when I first was teaching online because it was really new, uh, crazy. I didn't really believe it could be done. We were doing synchronous. How was I gonna? What I didn't realize is I wasn't the center of attention. So um, they were it was okay. I collected the feedback after every class, uh, and it really helped. Uh, I was on the right track, but um, I wouldn't say every class I did uh, initially. And then you chat, make sure students understand. Make don't let them, but this is kind of critical. Um, and I found take over online learning. If you end quickly and they don't know what's going on, it's going to cause you quite a bit of time afterwards. I don't understand. They're not feeling like they're working to you. And home activities, uh, going on with what Anne was saying, I'm doing about activities that they can kind of mingle. So these are a range of tools. I'm going to there, but you can collaborate creating a slide or on map teams. There's learning modules that you can create with TED, not TED Talks, but learning modules. Um, tools are great where you can actually have social reading of articles. The students don't seem to enjoy reading, especially our wonderful articles. And so they can start to comment on those articles as they do it. They can do it actually with videos. And they can see each other's comments um, as it's going so they can see how other people are reading the video. Uh, Flipgrid, where you can create videos, video presentations, which they can create. Ed Puzzle's great because it can, I, I mentioned briefly, which you may or not missed it, uh, missed. I can, I can throw my YouTube video in there and put questions at different points and stop them and say, okay, so what do you think of such and such? And they can answer that. And I can actually record their answers. Um, so there's lots of interesting home activities that they can do other than read this paper, which likely they won't, although they may use a tool called WordTune um, to shove the paper in and summarize it for you. Um, so there's all kinds of things that, uh, so we want to be, want to push ourselves, Anne, as you're saying, in terms of, of, of the kinds of things that we can do. Here's a few final ideas. I would form personal learning networks with other people. Um, and it's harder than you think, but um, uh, as a, an instructor, but I would ask the students to do, we, we ask them to form their personal learning networks, um, pick them in the large classes, because it's much easier to, to if you miss something. Uh, for you, I think it's best. Uh, you'll have missteps. Things won't work. They'll fall miserably. It's okay. Uh, talk about it and, and, and then improve. Self-care is important. So slow but sure is a good pace. Take care of yourself. How do you, you know, don't burn out. You can't be there 24 hours a day responding to student questions and stuff. You have to develop your pattern. Um, giving, getting feedback as you go. Stay calm. If something happened here, I was kicked out or whatever, uh, I can come back in. Um, it wasn't like the old days when I was using Adobe Connect, which was an old thing. <laughs> it was really hard to get back in. But um, sometimes you get blocked out. Uh, things happen. Um, if you're calm, students know what's going on. Okay, let's bring it together here. Um, oops, sorry, that was my mouse. Um, telling me I'm talking too much. And then have a discussion with ChatGPT about generating some ideas and things if you're, if you're feeling still lost. Um, so here's some resources. Um, and I um, found the best way for me for ChatGPT. I feel like I'm pushing ChatGPT. I'm just excited with it so that you don't please, please excuse that. Maybe, maybe the next time I do this is like, oh, I'll use ChatGPT. I don't think so, but um, I take a course with you, Demi, or one of these courses are $10 or $15. And it's like, oh, this is someone who's spending a life <laughs> doing this. And these are great ideas. I'll take those. Um, and so, yeah, that's my kind of information. 901, and uh, a little over because I was adding the ChatGPT. Um, but... Well, uh, like I said, Robin brings incredible practical ideas to the table and he did so again this afternoon. It's uh, uh, really fabulous. And I love the way you brought in ChatGPT as a way, uh, a vehicle, if you like, to generate some ideas yeah. that you can explore. And that's really a great suggestion. So thank you. Uh, Robin, thank you once again. I, I'm not sure if there are any uh, questions from any of the members. Uh, I didn't see anything else coming up in the chat. Um, without I particularly further, welcome challenges. And, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> that's not going to work for mine. Yeah. There's a lot of information coming at you. So. Open Network Learning, thanks you, um, Robin, for your time again this morning in your space and this afternoon in ours. Uh, it was lovely to have you here. And to the participants, thank you for joining us. Do all yes, travel safely. And thank you, Jacques. You can stop.